Hey, everybody. Absolutely stunning news over here this week. We have a video version of this week's episode available on our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash late night. Go over there, sign up at any tier, and you'll have access to it. Once again, that's patreon.com slash late night. Now, enjoy the show. So you showed us your your Zoom recorder. What else do you use to use to record your audio? Yeah, so I use the Zoom recorder to record my uh, condenser mics, but a lot of ASMRs actually just use the Zoom or just use the Tascam because they have like those little mics at the top and it sounds amazing. Um, I think a lot of them are just really good at editing. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm sure that it's just the mic. The mic itself is really good, but I use Sennheiser MK4. Oh, nice. Uh-huh. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm a musician and I don't know jack shit about gear. I use the things I use and then don't really know much about names and stuff like that. Same here. I know what I have. Like I will have people emailing me and they're like, they think I'm just this audio god because I do ASMR. <laughs> and right. they email me and they're like, I'm getting into voice acting and like, I want to know what the best like, what do you recommend to like this price point? Da, 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 da. And I'm just like, listen, I know that mic and I know this mic and that's it. I barely even know how to use my Zoom. (laughs) I was going to ask for uh, ASMR folks, like I could imagine gear turns into a big deal, like for people recording. Are there people in your world who are like total gearheads and it's this mic for this thing and this other mic for this thing? Yeah, absolutely. So there's lo-fi and there's hi-fi and there's everybody Mm -hmm. in between. I'm like more actually on the hi-fi end, um, but the majority of people use like their iPhones. Really? Or Blue Yeti. Or the little like Apple headphones, like holding it right here. Yes. I think it's only within the last like two years that people who are more on the techie side have started coming into the ASMR scene. Like there are people that have been in it for a long time, like GB ASMR and like Gentle Whispering that just know so much about tech. And then the cinematic ASMR, those people just know so much. Those are the people I message and I'm like, what's going on? How do I fix this? (laughs) Uh Gentle Whispering is the queen. I mean, I feel like she was the first. She probably wasn't the very first, but in terms of like first major ASMR YouTubers that I found, like way back in the day before the ASMR community was even a thing, really. It was like her and then a video of a guy playing with marbles. (laughs) And that was the extent of ASMR on YouTube. Yeah, she was the first one I found and it was only because of an article about her. And I thought she was like one of the first, but there's like years of people that even before her. Wow. Just whispering on YouTube, but it was called the Whisper Community. It wasn't called ASMR. Right. Mm. That's what I was going to ask because it wasn't called ASMR for a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know who coined that term and who how it started being labeled as ASMR, but once people found it and they made articles about it, then it kind of blew up. Right, right. But that was, not, that was only like, I want to say like four or five years ago. It was so recent. Yeah. Wow. It, it's really wild how big it is now in a way that is simultaneously surprising, but also not that surprising. It's one of those things where I feel like so many people experience it, but we had no idea what it was and just thought, wow, I am so weird for enjoying this person talking to me right now. Like, I'm just so (laughs) creepy. And then you find it and it's like, I'm not weird. A lot of people experience this. Well, and there are a lot of people who don't actually experience ASMR who really like ASMR videos just because they're relaxing or they like the production or the theme or whatever. I don't actually uh, get tingles, but I do experience like a relaxing feeling. Like it's a wave of calm. Yeah. I'm jealous of the people that get tingles, but... Yeah, it's it's strange being somebody who's always gotten the ASMR tingles and, you know, spending so long with the like, oh, I'm just weird, before it became a thing on the internet and being like, oh my God, that's a thing with a really long yes. name. <laughs> yes. When I was younger, I did experience tingles, but it just went away. So I'm like, wow. Yeah. I had a thing, th- this is not strictly relevant, but I'm going to say it anyway, which is basically my podcasting philosophy. But when I was a kid, our piano, I was taking piano lessons, and sometimes you would hit a particular timbre and the thing would like resonate like it was chimes. 
And I was never able to figure, it was the weirdest, like you'd hit some chord or something like that. And it would just go ring like that. And I don't know if I experienced tingles or not, but every time I think about tingles, I think about this magic, you know, it was like a piano from the forties or something that my mom had inherited or something. And I always think about like the tingles and is this just how pianos are? I grew up thinking that's just how pianos were. Right. And this piano, like anyone who has tingles, it's like either everybody gets this or maybe this is just a weird thing. It's just me. You don't know until you start getting it out there. And this is one of the things that's so interesting to me is then how many other things are like this that people are experiencing but don't know there's a whole community of folks that are also experiencing, right? There are some people that experience ASMR from music. Like they get tingles oh, as they listen to certain music. So, you know, I don't know. You might you might experience tingles but not realize it. Absolutely, yeah. I've, a few people said that they also experience tingles when they watch movies and they are like really into it, but it's not necessarily called ASMR. There's like a different name for it. I can't remember. And the other thing is I agree with that where there's just these small little communities on the internet and you don't even know they exist until something about them maybe gets popular, a tweet goes viral and it's like, oh my gosh, these people exist. Right. When you think of communities on the internet, which are just like into a very specific thing, what's the first example you think of? I'm sorry that the first place that my brain went to was Dragon's Fucking Cars. <laughs> okay. Yep. I'm sorry. We, as as, as we've discussed went. on the show. Yep. yep, I, yep, yep. I have so many questions. <laughs> There's a community <laughs> just around that specifically? Yeah. I can't tell how how much of it is in jest, but okay, okay. it exists. But that's the internet. That but is the, the internet. internet. Yeah. I can't think anything of anything like off the top of my head, but related to ASMR, but a completely separate community is mm-hmm. like voice acting ASMR, but it's not really ASMR. But I mean, it is, but they're like acting out scenarios. Like they're talking to you and I don't know, but they're like completely separate community almost than ASMR. The, the really? people that don't show their faces, but they have like pictures of like anime characters, but then they like talk to you as if they're the anime character. Like a, yeah, like, like a VTuber like v- kind of thing? Yeah, it's kind of like that. Oh, <laughs> actually I thought of one. Yes, please. So... <laughs> I have a friend that I play D&D with, and she has a character that she does on her channel that is a goblin, Whisper Windy of Smar. And she inadvertently found a community of like people who are really into goblins, like just like female goblins, but in like a sexy way. Where do I find these people? (laughs) Yeah, let's, okay, (laughs) hold on. Let the Googling commence. Hold on. What what would one Google? (laughs) It was on Twitter. Female goblins. I, I, okay, so I search I search sexy female goblins, and the first thing that comes up is a Pinterest board that just says 25 uncomfortably hot goblins ideas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty much that. Oh, I see, I see one here. I'm a, I'm on a Pinterest board also with some sexy fucking goblins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, on Twitter, there it's more like VTubers, I think, but some of mm-hmm. it was like artists. So they just have their little community where they just like love sexy goblins. That's great. There's some kind of weird NFT goblin community as well. Do you know about this? Goblin Town, I think is what it's called. Here, they have a particular, hold on, I have to find this because it's it's it's, a particular- It's like Bored Ape with Goblins. Is that what you're talking about? It's like Bored Ape with Goblins. But the thing that is interesting about it on Twitter is that they use a particular kind of script- to write, which I I don't know what it's called, but it's like some letters are real tiny and the they're all oh, kind yeah, of out yeah, of yeah. alignment. Yes. Oh, there's a name for it, I'm sure. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know the name for it, but I know exactly what you're talking about. To like make it seem like they're talking in a weird little goblin voice. Correct. Or something like yeah. that. And yeah. they use sort of, you know, like goblin-y, you know, incorrectly conjugated verbs and things like yeah. that, you know. <laughs> I love like that I go to store so or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think that maybe... NFTs are the least coolest thing, thing you've ever possible. heard of. <laughs> oh, sorry. NFTs, they spread like wildfire and then they, they also went out like wildfire. Yeah. And goblins everywhere rejoice. Yes. <laughs> yes. Here's a Reddit thread. Are there female goblins and how do they reproduce? <laughs> oh, well, wow. awful. I mean, awful. they're humanoids. 
They can also reproduce however you want them to. Yeah. Well, true. You can make it up. They're a fantasy. I think it's like related to like monster stuff. Like people like the monster NSFW. Yes. yes. So I think that's kind of what it's related to. Yeah. There's a big, there's a big overlap. Same with like machine slash evil robot ones, you know? And dragons and cars. And, and dragons and cars. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Brian, should we introduce the show? For some context. <laughs> well, look, Layton, if you want, I guess we could. I mean, wow. sure. This well, is everybody. Everybody. Yeah. Oh, well, hey, do you want to do on, it? Hold on. Hold on. I'm doing okay, the intro. What? what? Okay, fine. <laughs> Fuck, it's fucking fine. I don't care. <laughs> All right. Everyone at home, welcome to another wonderful episode of Layton Night with Brian Wecht and Layton, who is back now. Brian Wecht, that's you over there. That's me. Do you want to say hi? That's me, yes. Great. Hi, everybody. This is Brian Wecht. My name is Brian Wecht. I'm crushing it. Mystery guest, who are you and what do you do? I am Amy K. ASMR, and I make ASMR videos on YouTube. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Hooray. I believe, Layton, is this correct? Uh, Amy is our first ASMR artist on the show, I believe. Is that correct? Yes. I'm so honored. She's also my favorite. <laughs> ah! Yes. Oh, that makes me so happy. <laughs> we were talking about you know, having some ASMR people on the show, Layton was immediately like, we got to get Amy K. Like, just beeline right away. <laughs> so we're very, very excited to have you have you on this week. Oh my gosh, that makes me so happy. I was looking at <laughs> some people that you've had on the podcast and I was like, they haven't had any other ASMRs? They're going to choose me? Me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, because you're great. I'll take it. <laughs> the Thank algorithm you. handed me one of your silly tiefling videos and then it was <gasps> just like the whole rabbit hole oh, from yeah. there. Just you're so creative and fun and funny with them. You do a great job. I try. I try. The tiefling videos. Oh my gosh. My first one, I dressed up like in full pink face yeah. paint and it was so much fun. It was that one. Oh my gosh. That was a while ago, actually. <laughs> For people who haven't seen these, can you describe what that means, tiefling? Oh yeah. So it's actually a D&D &D race and they're mostly humanoid, but they're generally, they range from like human colors to pink or green or blue or purple. And they have horns and fangs. And usually they have like pointed ears, but it's because they're humans that were cursed by a, a devil. Oh. Yeah. So it's like all their generations are cursed. Oh, wow. That sucks. What a bummer. <laughs> what a bummer. <laughs> but what a bummer for tieflings. Yeah. Actually, do we need to back up slightly further and explain ASMR to people? people oh, just in case yeah. people have don't know yes let, let's do it not because i think people don't know but because i want to hear how you explain it oh so i hate this question because i've gotten asked it by um like family members that don't even understand youtube <sighs> and i never oh, know great. how to explain it correctly so i usually go pretend i'm an old man who doesn't understand yes. the internet you don't really have to pretend yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I usually say I speak softly in videos and tell people nighttime stories or just, it's kind of like people who like to listen to the TV while they fall asleep. It's like that, but I make the sounds like quieter and softer and nicer to listen to. If they're understanding it, I will go even further and say, well, if you've ever, you know, maybe your mom brushed your hair when you were younger or you really enjoyed getting your hair cut and it just really calmed you down or you liked the doctor paying attention to you or something, I'm trying to recreate that feeling in a video. And that usually kind of gets them on board. They're like, okay. That's a great explanation. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. And then you get the people that are like, oh, like, so you're one of those people that like eat food and like, it's like food <laughs> fetish stuff. And I'm like, no. No, that's not it. I like characterizing someone as one of those people that eats food. Yeah. You, one of those people that eats food on the internet? Like every day you eat food? Gross. <laughs> yeah. Every day? But yeah, I, and then also ASMR stands for Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response, yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I guess more specifically... It has become a thing on YouTube to do this, but prior to the YouTube era of ASMR, it was just like everybody would get a tingly feeling in their head when like somebody did something really methodically with their hands or like that scene in Toy Story 2 where the guy is restoring Woody or like yeah. any sort of variety of things and it makes your head go tingly. 
And for the longest time, people were like, what is that? I don't know what that is. And now it's like a whole cottage industry of creating that feeling or just, you know, doing nice little nighttime stuff. Yeah. I remember feeling so weird. Like when I was younger, my mom loved MAC makeup, but I think mostly she just liked that they would do your makeup for you. And even though I was like younger, she would be like, oh, put some makeup on my daughter too. And I loved it so much. So you'd go into the store and sit down at the little counter and they would do your makeup. So they do your makeup, but they also sell it to you. And this is, that's something that I actually like is when someone's trying to sell me something, but you can tell it's rehearsed. Like what they're saying is rehearsed. They are not really talking to you. They're talking at you. And I don't know why that's so tingly, Mm -hmm. (laughs) but those are the first instances of me actually feeling real tingles. And I thought, wow, what the heck is this feeling? And of course, I mean, this is weird, but when you're younger, you're like, am I into women? Like, is this what that is? Right. But then you, right. when you get older, you're like, okay, no, no, it's, it's ASMR. Well, yeah. for, for me, it's both. <laughs> yeah. It was both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plot twist. Yeah. Your first thought. I think that's why ASMR kind of has this sort of weird, um, like stigma is because yeah. the first thought is, is this sexual? But then you realize right. it's, it's not. Yeah. Especially when you try to explain it using the word tingles people get weird and so much of it is like personal attention and it's like here's a really pretty lady or a very handsome man just like touching you all up next to the camera but it's like it is not like that (laughs) yeah and it's so intimate and that's why people get that mixed up it is interesting because it's an intimate physical sensation which is not sexual and those are Mm -hmm. relatively few and far between at least in the way they're discussed publicly i would guess right And I think also a lot of people really lack intimacy in like that sort of friendship motherly way. They they don't often get that. And so when they do get a little bit of it, they confuse it with like Mm -hmm. sexual intimacy. So that's right. I understand why people get it mixed up, but it's part of learning, you know, teaching people like Yeah. But the majority of the people that watch my videos and watch a lot of ASMR totally understand that. So Yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. The comment sections on ASMR videos are generally really <laughs> sweet and cute. And it's yeah. just a bunch of sleepy They're people so nice. hanging out. <laughs> Everybody is so, so nice to me. And every time I think That's about great. like maybe making a second channel, I'm like, oh my gosh, but the comments, they, they'll <laughs> actually <laughs> talk back to me. So Amy, I was going to ask you, how did you first enter the wide world of YouTube ASMR? How'd that start for you? Well, after I found that article in Gentle Whispering and I realized that ASMR was like a real thing and it wasn't me being weird, of course, I dove deeper into the community and I found like Latte ASMR and I found uh, like Goodnight Moon and a bunch of people that do more role play stuff, like the White Rabbit ASMR. She did a lot of characters and I loved that. Those were my favorite. And um, I thought like, dang, it would be so cool to do what they do. And I've always been interested in like acting and stuff. I did some acting in like high school, not just like in the plays and stuff. And I always made videos with my friends, but uh, I was like, you know what? I think I might just like try it out. Just like put my foot in it. And at first it was just as a hobby because you think like nobody's going to watch this. There's so many people on YouTube I remember the, one of my videos got 100 views and I was like, dang, that's a lot. Oh, I remember this. For my first video also, like, I think we got to like 500 views or something for my band. And we were like, <laughs> what the fuck? Oh, yeah. Yes. Sick. You know, it was so exciting. Yes. Yes. And also, I always wanted to like dress up in cosplay. That was something I've never done. I barely even did makeup because I I worked at a coffee shop and your makeup melts off because you're running around all the time. So I never really did right. makeup, but I wanted to, like, I wanted to be those, those people that did that. And I was like, eh, here's a, an excuse to buy a costume or whatever and learn this stuff. And yeah, now I do it full time. So that's, <laughs> that's so amazing. Great. How, how was that transition? Did you start four years ago? I think like four, I always forget. It's hard to say because I made the YouTube channel like 10 years ago, but I had just watched videos and then I was like, might as well use this one. But it'll be five, I think, in August. Ooh, that's great. Congratulations. Wow. Yeah. 
that makes your channel a Leo, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) At what point did you make that transition into doing it full time? That actually wasn't until, I want to say two years ago, because it's hard to let go of a steady paycheck. And I wasn't like just a barista. I was a manager at the time. And you are so used to getting a certain amount of money. It's not, it wasn't like a lot of money, but I was like about hitting the same amount. Like my YouTube made just about as much as what I made from Starbucks. And then I, you know, I had health insurance and all this stuff. But the thing is I moved to a different state. I worked for Starbucks in Seattle, which the closer you are to the headquarters, I would say the better the Starbucks. Okay, good to know. I hate to be that way. (laughs) It's very true. I moved to a different state on the East Coast and it was just horrid. And I don't know if it's just like the people in the area, but like they are not nice to their baristas. Can I ask, which state is this? I live in Florida. I don't think you're the first person to say some people in Florida aren't cool. Like, yeah. I, I feel like that's a relatively true statement that a lot of people agree with. I just, I don't know what it is. I mean, there are, are a lot of people that are extremely nice here. Like, I'm not used to walking down the street and people like looking in the eye and say, hello, good morning. Like, yep. when you live in some cities, like, you just, you're just like, don't look at me, don't talk to me. But here, there is that Southern hospitality. But I don't know what it is. They just treat their service people like crap. And as a manager, your job is to deal with the customers that are, you know, having problems. Well, there's like Southern hospitality, but the part that doesn't get talked about as much is there is so much passive aggression that that is covering. Oh, yeah. Just the, oh, oh, bless your heart of it all, where it's like a nice veneer on kind of a shitty disposition, I guess. It feels very condescending. In a way. Yes. Right. Although sometimes they will say it straight to your face. It depends. Like, for example, (laughs) this was during COVID, by the way. I was Uh still working during COVID. And I work with a a lot of high schoolers. And her mom had cancer. And so many people didn't want to wear masks. Right? And I was very stickler about it. So if someone came in, I would not ring them up unless they put on a mask. And I even had masks for them. Say, here you go. Here's a mask. And most people just like, oh, fine. And they put it on. But there was this one person. This is the week I quit. He was like, no, I refuse. And I was like, well, you know, there are a lot of people here. Like they have family with conditions that they can't get COVID. They cannot get COVID. And he was like, he looked me straight in the eye and he was like, I don't care who dies. I don't care if you die. Like, what? Just like straight up, I don't care about your health. Like he just looked at me straight in the eye and was just like, I don't give a shit about you. And I, wow. I had to serve him. That's insane. In the end, that particular store didn't have a backbone because when I complained to my higher manager, they were like, just serve him. Ugh. Okay. I was like, bye. <laughs> that level of aggressive assholery is just unthinkable yeah. to me. It's not like you're like, okay, I need you to you know, cut open your palm and bleed on the counter for 30 seconds yes. before I serve you. It's like, take this small piece of fabric yes. and place it over your face for the 15 seconds it'll take us to complete this transaction. Yeah, what the and fuck? they're like the one person in the store. And uh, yeah, it'll take like literally a minute to the whole interaction, two minutes. But for people that you're asking to make you a nice little coffee beverage, like, are you yeah. kidding me? I was never that person that would give someone decaf because... <laughs> You know, I don't know. I'm like too nice. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I don't. I don't know. The, I don't know this trick. Some people would. This is, I guess, is a common barista thing. If you don't like someone, you'll slip them a decaf and not tell them. If they are especially rude that day, generally we don't do that. We will always serve people and give them it's exactly what they awesome. wanted. Yes. But if they were especially rude, yeah, some people would do that. And um, be aware, <laughs> people out there listening, if you're rude to your barista, maybe you're not going. Gonna- That's amazing. I'm always curious. What is the wildest drink that someone ordered while you were there? I want to hear the fucked up shit people get off with in Starbucks. It's been many years, but the most annoying stuff is just when people want like one of this, like, like one Splenda, one this, one that. There are a lot of people that want butter 
in their coffee, but then you blend it in the blender, it's actually not too bad. But when people mix up different syrups, that's disgusting. Most of it is just people being really, really particular. Mm -hmm. This one woman, she would come in every single day at night and order a venti caramel frappuccino. Mm -hmm. And venti is 26 ounces. And she wants this much caramel on the bottom. So we basically would squeeze half a caramel bottle. Three fingers of caramel. (laughs) Yes. And she would look at it and tell you if it was not enough. And you also had to do caramel walls and caramel on top. And it wasn't just a little. I mean, she wants it to be sopping. Like on the side, you don't want to see the drink. caramel walls. You mean you coat the walls with caramel? Is you that coat what that means? the walls with caramel. I didn't know that was called caramel walls. That's awesome. Yeah, it's called caramel. I mean, usually caramel walls is just a little bit, but there are so many of these people that if it's not very specific, they will make you remake it. But yeah, no surprise. That was when I was in Seattle, and I happened to live in an area where drugs happened to be, you know, uh huh, drug mm, problems. A thing. So yeah, yeah, a thing. So at night, you'll get a lot of those extra, extra caramel drinks. Yeah. Wow. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. There was even one lady that would order a drink like that, but it was like sugar free. She would want like 10 packets of Splenda in her caramel frappuccino, not fat, whatever. Yeah, I know. (laughs) But um, she was always so mean, so mean. She would come in every single day and then she didn't show up for like a month. And then she came back and she was the first person I saw because I work all the time. And she was like, hey, I just want to apologize for how I acted to you. I was on meth and I was just like, (laughs) Oh, wow. Like, thank you for the apology. Wow. (laughs) Still ordered the same drink, but less Splenda. (laughs) Yeah. Good for her for apologizing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No one ever apologizes to baristas, (laughs) but that person did. And I was like, wow, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I don't, what exactly is the science of like opioids makes you really want sweet stuff? I, I didn't know that for a really long time until somebody told me about it. I didn't know that until you said it right now. Oh. I think they just crave it. Yeah, it might not just be opioids. There is something about like harder drugs that really makes you want sweet yeah. stuff. And it's not just sugar. It's like they want their drinks made with like half and half or like heavy cream too. Mm. Mm. Heavy cream is like 80% fat. It is so thick. Like you take a drink of it and it just coats your mouth. It's disgusting. Right. But they want their lattes made with that. Like that's the stuff we use to make the whipped cream. You just shake it up and it turns into whipped cream, but they want it literally in a drink. I love a big heavy, heavy, a little bit of heavy cream in my coffee at home. Well, where it's just a like bit. I only need Absolutely. a little bit. <laughs> that's where the butter comes in too. Like you think, ew, gross butter and brewed coffee, but it's actually really good. I know a lot of what, about, it, what do they call it? Like bullet coffee? Bulletproof. Or, yeah. Bulletproof. Bulletproof. Yes. Bulletproof coffee. So with yeah, a little bit of butter, a little bit of heavy cream. Pretty so good. good. Yeah. A friend of mine recommended these to me. And I was like, no, f- are you kidding me? No, fuck no. I'm not doing that. That sounds nuts. And I was like, well, you know, don't knock it till you tried it. And I tried it. I was like, fuck me. This is good. And then, <laughs> then I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe I should start drinking these. And then I realized I was adding like a thousand calories to my diet for literally no reason. Mm. And was like, well, maybe it's not worth it. <laughs> you know, just just because it tasted pretty good once. Liquid calories, you don't even think of them. But I actually, I was doing like 10,000, 13,000 steps a day while I worked there because I worked like eight eight hour plus shifts. Oh yeah. You're running around so much when you're a barista. And I actually lost weight leaving Starbucks, even though I sit on my butt all day because of the sugary drinks. Because you get get free drinks. So you just like ingest coffee, sugary coffee all day. Yeah, yeah. Don't even realize- what was your go-to drink? I promise we'll stop talking about Starbucks. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I have so many crazy stories about working there because I worked there for seven years. Wow. But uh, yeah, crazy. But my go-to drink was a uh, either an Americano with like a pump of white mocha, always iced, mm-hmm. or a dirty chai, which is a chai tea latte with an added shot. Great. So when you decided to leave Starbucks and do... YouTube stuff full time. I made a similar decision. I left a stable job as a tenured yep. professor and then quit that to do music full time. It was fucking terrifying yes. for me. So I'm curious what emotionally it was like for you to make this transition. First of all, it felt pretty liberating because I ended up hating that job. But also, yeah, it's so scary. You almost gain 
Like if you didn't have anxiety before, you have anxiety now because- Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> you always think like that every video you put out, if it does like even like slightly less than you expected it to do, you think this is over, my career is over. I, I'm going to have to go find a new job. And like, of course, I'd love to do this for the rest of my life. But you're always thinking like, well, how long does a YouTube career last? And- some mm-hmm. people, it's like they burn out so quick and it's maybe a two, three year thing. But then there are others like like Gentle Whispering that's been doing it for, gosh, I don't know, 10 plus years. And I hope yeah. that I can do that. So yeah, I, I'm like constantly worrying. What I like is when you put out a video, there's one of two options. And one is it does well. And then you get to feel, mm-hmm. oh my God, I'll never be able to do this again. And the other is it does poorly and you're like, oh my God, it's doing so poorly. Fuck. Yeah. And it is a, emotionally, it is a lose-lose proposition unless you can somehow just convince yourself. And this is the hard part. And this is something I struggle with every day is just like, just go along for the ride, try to be aware of trends, but not obsessive about them. Yeah. And then do the best work you can and do what you want to do, do the things you think are interesting and then... Hopefully, yeah. hopefully things just kind of work out. But, you know, we, we've had stuff that has done very well. And then it's like, fuck, now I have to live up to that. Damn it. Oh, th- and that's almost you know? worse, too, because you, then you're like, oh, my gosh, like, how do I top that? Like, it did so well. How do I top right. that? And how did I do it? Like, how did I, yes. how did I do yeah. that thing that was like, what good? What did they like about that so much? What did how they did like about that? that? Yes. yes. Because you can't, you know, ask every single person, what specifically did you like the best about all this? Right. And sometimes they don't even know really what they like yeah. about it. Like when my alien yes. series got popular, I did like a year a cow. Yeah. Series. <laughs> yeah. And that Very got popular. Good. That was just like a throwaway video. Some ideas I spend months like thinking about. And then some I just like spend maybe a day or up to a week thinking about it. And that was just a throwaway video to fill in some space. And people loved it. And it took me so long to figure out what the heck people even liked about it. You just never, you never know. Did you come to a conclusion? (laughs) You know, kind of. So um, at first I thought maybe it was the personality. Like she was kind of a dumb, like personality or like bubbly. So I kind of tried to recreate that. People, they were like, eh, okay. So it wasn't that. It ended up being, I think, the personal attention part of it, but they're like amazed by you. It's not just like that they're giving personal attention. It's that the smallest thing that normally people wouldn't care about, like your nose, it's like, okay, whatever, it's your nose. But they are just like so amazed by your nose. It's like you put zero effort in and they think you're the greatest thing ever. And I think that was part of it. <laughs> uh huh. That is such an interesting, because I think there's so much like psychologically happening with so many of the personal care ASMR things where it's like what connects and is validating about this? Because sometimes you have a day and you get into bed and you want to go to sleep and then it's just like self-care affirmations and it's just (laughs) somebody who's nice and telling you that you're good and you're going to sleep well. Like it's interesting that you would pick up on that from something as like silly as abducted by aliens. But I guess one that stuck in my mind that I really, really loved. Oh, I can't believe this was five months ago, but Time Traveler offers you Doritos, which is sort oh. of the the amazed and the disgusted <laughs> direction. Yes. So, you know, it's so funny. Is I was going to say there, of course, I love it when people are like super nice to me and they are, you know, telling me good things. But I, I also love ASMR where people are just like so rude to me. It's and that's the, the other reason why I think the not cow one did well because people loved it when I called them like bags of flesh or like disgusting or like, ooh, you're a cow. Uh-huh. And they're like, oh yeah, tell me more. I'm like, what? <laughs> not in like a sexy way, but like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, but yeah, like that one especially is one where I'm just like, ooh, you're disgusting. But <laughs> I also like enjoy that. Like, Sometimes yeah. from ASMR videos. It's funny too. Like I think so many of them are so funny and like, yeah. yes. how often are you sticking to like a straight script versus improv? So the beginning I like to script, just to like get me in like the zone of improv. And then from there, I just have like points that I want to hit and then the rest is improv. So it's like, it's a mix. I'd say about 50, yeah. 50 or sometimes it's like 75 improv. There's truly nothing better than insults being said in a cheerful way. Yeah. (laughs) Like, you know, 
you are just disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> what I just said had a little bit of a, an edge to it, but if you can do that without the edge, it's so great. I think that is truly one of the funniest things. They don't mean it in like a really rude way. They mean it in right. just like a plain statement. Like, wow, you look unshowered, you know? <laughs> I have an eight-year-old and this is my life where, yeah. because she's eight, she doesn't really understand what she's saying a bunch of the time. And sometimes, you know, like she'll just walk by me and she'll be like, daddy, your hair looks terrible today. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Why is that so cute? <laughs> Thank you, honey. Why? But it's cute, right? I'm not yes. mad. It's just well, like- Well, and then you currently are, are, are passing that along to my dog, which is a thing that I also do. So Brian and his family are watching my dog while I deal with an exterminator problem here. And Aww. it's just so much fun to be like, you are a little freak. Layton has an infestation of exterminators and she's setting out little traps <laughs> for the exterminators. <laughs> well, I'm send, I've it, gotten sorry. a bunch of rats to come in and get rid of the exterminators, but- <laughs> yeah. you know, Oh, perfect. <laughs> they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we hurl insults in a cheerful way at Layton's dog, maybe- uh-huh. It, it's really one of my favorite things talking to a dog. Well, I'll just be like, maybe, maybe you're just so fucking stupid. You're just like <laughs> oh a, my gosh. a, a I little, do the little same dummy thing. Yeah, my cats. It's just so funny. I'm like, like if they do some things, it was like you're just a stupid dumb bitch, and they're like, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, I know. You, my, my my affectionate nickname for maybe is Stoops because yeah. she's so stupid. <laughs> I love it, and she's a great dog. You want a nice stupid dog. Yes. Yeah. The dumber a dog is, the more I trust it. The smarter a cat is, the less I trust it. 100%. But maybe nothing happening between the ears. I have two cats and sometimes I think they're smart and then they do something and I'm like, you are so dumb. You are so yeah. dumb. <laughs> we have a video of Layton's dog in our backyard chasing a squirrel. And the squirrel, we have like a little deck chair that the squirrel is on. Maybe nine inches above this dog's head. And the squirrel is like standing there and the dog is like, no, what? <laughs> it cannot find the fucking squirrel, which is directly above her, which she saw go up there, by the way. Yeah, it's like, isn't this in your DNA? No. Yeah. It's like you, you, you were bred to hunt exactly this kind of animal and you are failing. Not the hunting. I can understand failing at hunting. It's hard. Squirrels are fast, but to, not be able to pinpoint the location of it even it seems like a, a complete system failure. Yeah. That's how I feel when I try to point out treats to my cat. Like it's on the floor in front of them and they're trying to find it. They know it's there, but I'm like right there, right, right there. It's right, right there. there. Eat it. Don't you have a nose that's like way better than humans? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's what they say, but I don't even know if I believe it. No. <laughs> what are your What are your cat's names? Biscuit and gravy. Biscuit that and gravy. Is fantastic. Yeah. Incredible. There's a Fallout mod that I really love that's just called Biscuits, and it lets you have a Chihuahua, and the Chihuahua's name oh. is Biscuits. And so, <laughs> love that. Yeah, that's great. I love running around in Fallout and just being like, "Go get them, Biscuits!" And he's like, you know, <laughs> this big attacking a Death Claw or whatever. Mm-hmm. Brian, I was gone for a while, and I don't think I mentioned Fallout much on the last episode, but there I go again, back in the <laughs> there you go. Well, we all have our games that we go back to. Well, okay. Now let's talk about this. So what are what are your games, Amy? Well, games that I just play over and over, I'd say like any Zelda game and Skyrim mm-hmm. sometimes and Stardew Valley. Who's your Stardew Valley spouse? <laughs> You're going to judge me, uh, but it's Sebastian. <laughs> Sebastian's okay. a valid pick. Yep. Yeah. I, feel I think it. like any pick is pretty good unless it's that chicken guy, whatever his name is. Shane. <laughs> Shane. If you choose Shane, I full on judge you. Like, okay, I'm judged. Get some therapy. Judged. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you serious? <laughs> yeah. I, should, I probably should have asked you first. <laughs> like, who are you trying to fix, okay? This is, no. this is why I'm in therapy. <laughs> Podcaster <laughs> destroyed by ASMR. Oh my gosh, no. I, <laughs> no, my it, it's, no, no, it's fine. It's okay. To be fair, my sister also chooses Shane and I make fun of her for yeah. it. Well, that was like my first playthrough was Shane and now on my like ninth playthrough or whatever, I married Leah and then just divorced her to go after Haley because I felt like yeah. that was my farmer having a midlife crisis. Leah was my second playthrough. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta go with the tortured artist. Yeah. And then, you know, she was just getting a little too cozy on the farm and I, I was just like <laughs> playing Stardew and just her being like, you go to the island every single day. Like you don't even come back here. Like I'm just alone on this farm and you're going to leave me with the pigs. Now, you know, yeah. divorced 
Haley. Well, it's because they don't have dialogue after you get married. Yeah. Their, their dialogue is like, True. good morning, honey. And actually a lot of dating sim games, I don't even know what you would really call them, cozy farm dating games. Yeah, yeah. Like Rune Factory and um, like Harvest Moon and stuff. After you marry any of the people, they no longer have a personality and it's just so annoying. But Oh, it's the same in Skyrim too. I mean, that's yeah. that's a real bad you just one. go to the house. Yeah. Like Ayla, you're li- literally a huntress. You're so cool. You're just hanging around Whiterun. What are you doing? Yeah. Yep. Because you have a Skyrim video or a few of them. Oh, I have a few, yeah. The glitchy Skyrim one actually <gasps> might have been my first one, which I love. <laughs> I'm so proud of that one. I was really proud of that one. Even though, you know, I look back and I'm like, oh my gosh, the green screen was terrible and everything was so like, lighting was terrible. But you know what? That was the point of it. Oh yeah, it's the part of the aesthetic. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. And even um, <laughs> there was this guy at the time that made me think of this video. He was one of the first people to do like the Skyrim NPCs where he would pretend to be them. I forget his name, but he actually commented on my YouTube video. And I was like, so excited. I was like, oh my God, this guy commented on it. Uh, Cause he was like blowing up on TikTok. And then like a year or two later, he like murdered his wife. Yeah. Whoa. I was about to say that I know exactly yeah. who you're talking. And it was his <laughs> the wife who was in the videos with him. Yeah. And I was just like, really? oh, so much for that comment. Like, yeah. Wait. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. Skyrim sucks. <laughs> yeah. That's the conclusion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Skyrim. Yeah. No, but I remember watching those videos in high school, right? And, uh, yeah. Horrible. That's terrible. Yeah. But look, if we were going to delete all the YouTube comments from murderers, we'd have a lot fewer YouTube comments. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> I don't even know if I deleted it. I think I left it up because I was like, this is history now. Like, I, I think that's a good move. Because every once in a while, I'll get people that are like, whoa, isn't this the guy that, you know, and it's just right. like, yeah, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> so aside from the alien abduction ones, have there been other videos that have really surprised you in terms of how people related to them or like ones that got really popular that you didn't expect? One that I didn't think would go very far, but went pretty far, was my when I dressed up as Joyce Byers and I just pretended to be your mom. <laughs> and people like <laughs> apparently really liked that. It's one of my top viewed videos. I was like, okay, people just really want me to be their mom. And that's fine because that's also an ASMR <laughs> thing. But it was like it just it was just a silly video, and that one got really popular. Um, Robot Overlord examines you. That one also, I did not expect it to do so well. I don't know why. That was another mean one. It was another one where I was looking at you like, wow, you humans are so inferior to robots. Like your eyes don't even have like (laughs) night vision. Ugh. (laughs) Yeah. Those ones did pretty well. Pretty much almost all of them that I don't put a lot of effort into. And yet somehow they have like 800K views. I'm like, how did this happen? That's when you stop and you go, what did people like about this? Like, what is it? 100%. We think about this all the time when when writing songs. It's like, as our producer tells us every time, the surest way to not write a hit is to try to write a hit. Yeah. If you try to do something people will like, it's not going to be as popular as that dumb idea you shit out in two minutes where you were like, oh, this just feels right. That's always going to win. And I've given up trying to science. I've never really tried that hard, but like trying to science my way into understanding what's going to be popular. Yeah. Views always roller coaster. And it's usually when the views are like more down that you start analyzing it a lot harder and you don't, you you try not to, but you still overanalyze it. And especially when I do like bigger videos that are like bigger sets, more scripted, like, you know, different angles, whatever. Those never do very well, which is fine. I've learned this and I do those videos for me because they're fun, the more cinematic ones. But when you go too cinematic, it actually ends up losing the intimacy almost because it feels too much like a movie. That's what I've deduced is that it just feels too much like a movie. I gravitate towards like lower fidelity stuff just because there's something about like a really crappy microphone and a lot of room tone that just like actually gives you more tingles. I don't know exactly what that is, but it's part of it. If it's like a really old recording or if it's just, you know, really crappy little mic. I know a lot of ASM artists will like intentionally go for the crappier ones. I think we get tingle immunity sometimes. And I usually gravitate towards lo-fi 
if I've just watched too much ASMR and like nothing is doing it for me. Because yeah, it feels more intimate. It feels closer. It feels like like a friend is right there because it's just like, I don't mm. know, something about the crappiness of the, the camera. And like yeah. the sounds mm. are also harsher. Yeah. And sometimes that just gives you more tingles. Yeah. I love limitations that become aesthetics. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. this is the mic I have. And this is what I started out on. And this is just my sound now. Like, this is the, the yeah. thing I, or it is a choice I can make for a thing I want to do, right? On TikTok, I feel like if you don't have a blue Yeti, people aren't watching those. Oh, really? Especially TikTok people. They hmm. really like lo-fi. That's interesting. There's like a fine line with triggers for people because I think I know a lot of people who are turned off by ASMR because they can't stand like mouth sounds or eating or stuff like that. Mm -hmm. For me, there are certain things like slime ASMR videos. I like slime ASMR videos, but when they poke it with their fingers, I'm out. Like that <laughs> hard, like aggressive mm. poke, I'm out. Yes. And, and I know for some people it's eating I don't exclusively like eating ones, but like ASMR The Chew, where she just like eats really big pickles into it. Love it for some reason. Yeah. But do you have a, a line of like triggers that you're just not into or don't want to do? Well, there are a few triggers that I won't do because I feel like they're like a little too suggestive, like mm -hmm. ear licking or like yeah. mic pumping or like kisses. Mm -hmm. The thing is like, I get it. I get all of that stuff, but I think that it's really easy for people to be parasocial. So those are the ones I won't yes, do myself, yeah. but there aren't many triggers that I just would say like, oh, I hate that. Other than lo-fi for me, again, even though I do really like it, there are some people that they are just too aggressive with their mic and they're like smacking it and like you hear like <laughs> Getting the reverb. Getting up on that thing, huh? <laughs> and yeah, and there's like, they don't have a stand so you can hear like the, th -th 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 -th. like, I don't know if you ever used Blue Yeti, like. If you don't have a stand that thuds every time you touch it. So it's like, sure, thud. so I, I can't stand that. But also like very specifically, there's like a tongue clicking thing that people do that I can't stand it. It's like, like that. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. That thing. That's like the most specific thing. I just, I can't stand when they just like fill the empty space with the clicking. Hmm. Yeah. It's okay to have open space because then when the sound finally comes, it's like, oh, that's great. Yeah. That one doesn't bother me as much, but it's interesting watching how common little ticks like those become. Yeah. Like I, I feel like I didn't see slash hear a lot of that for a long time. And then it's become like more pervasive. Also just like sort of the, I feel like f fast and aggressive ASMR has, is like a new thing for me yeah. in terms of seeing a ton of it. And it doesn't really do it for me because it's kind of the opposite of what I want. Yeah. But it's interesting. Like, I, I would never have, like, guessed that that would be an offshoot. It blew up. Yeah. I mean, it's always been here, actually. Fast ASMR has always been here. It's off the top of my head, literally someone, her name is Fast ASMR. Like, Alyssa ASMR and, like, Raffi Taffy. Like, they've always done, like, fast triggers, but they it never really became a full trend until a few people on TikTok got popular from it and came to YouTube. And then it just, of course, everybody is always watching the trends. And so we pick up on the things and then everybody does it. And then it became a full trend. But yeah, for me personally, I'll like only one or two videos of Fast Day Smart has worked for me, but mostly it just, yeah, just gives me anxiety. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was going to ask, and please say no to this if you don't want to do it, Amy. Okay. Layton, should you and I try some ASMR right <laughs> now and we can get feedback from a professional? <laughs> that sounds horrifying to me. <laughs> okay. You can do it. I'm not going to do it. How about this? Amy, just based on what you know about me from the last hour talking, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what's something you think I should try were I to do ASMR? Brian, I have a note. Yes. Yes, I please. have notes. You yes. could try shutting your mouth. Like, <laughs> no talking ASMR. <laughs> for longer Thank periods you. Yeah, of time. Right. Which yeah, is a thing. Perfect. No talking ASMR is a thing. Of course. Um, you might be someone actually that would do ASMR. There is this subset of ASMR where people talk about stuff that they know just in like a soft-spoken voice. Oh, okay. They just pick a topic and maybe it's like a history topic or it maybe it's about music and they just talk about everything they know. And it's almost like they're teaching you. Well, okay. Let me try this. 
And, and by the way, if this seems in any way like it's making fun of people who do this, that is not what I'm going for here in any <laughs> sense. I, I am doing this with an open heart. I'm going to read one of my science papers. So here, here's a question. Is it like, am I trying to be kind of whispery? Am I, do I just talk in my normal voice? I imagine there's options, but like, what, what, what should I do? Generally, it's either soft speaking or whispering. Like there's a type of whisper that people do that's like, hi, hi, my name is Amy. Oh, that's, that's like enough sounds... whispering you want to do. Very You know impressive. how they're just like, yes. <sighs> yeah, there's Stage a lot of whisper. people that do that. But I personally, I prefer soft speaking. But yeah, just like, you're just like talking lower. Okay, you know, great. Maybe. So I'm going to then here, I'm going to pull up my most well-known science paper and I'm going to read it. <laughs> okay. ASMR yeah, I want to hear style. Your, your ASMR voice. <laughs> Okay. Now this may be this may be the first theoretical physics ASMR ever. I really think you'd be surprised. I'm sure I would be surprised. You're not even close, Brian. There's a lot of it. Oh, okay, wow. great. I love it. Sorry. I love it. <laughs> Here we go. Gotta get in the headspace. All right. The four D N equals one superconformal algebra is SU two two slash one, whose bosonic part is SO four comma two times U one R. Thus Every n equals one superconformal field theory, SCFT, must have a conserved U1R symmetry whose current is in the same superconformal multiplet as the stress energy tensor. There might be additional global flavor symmetries, F. The full symmetry group of the n equals one SCFT is then SU22 slash one cross F. The additional global symmetry, F, acts as a quote, non R, unquote, symmetry, i.e., the supercharges are invariant. For example, N equals one SQCD is believed to flow to an interacting SCFT for NF in the range three NC is greater than NF is greater than three halves NC. And the additional global symmetry of the SCFT is F equals SUNF cross SUNF cross UNB. Genuinely, I actually thought that was really good. You have a really good oh, wow. soft Thank speaking you. voice. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. I think you could actually make that into an ASMR video and I think people would watch it. You have a good soft speaking voice. Thank you. And it has Thank like you. that sort of okay. like professor cadence as you were reading it. Yeah, I actually thought that was really good. <laughs> I'm now going to force you to read that whole paper and put it on our YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long one. That is a, let's see, how many pages? Even better, because then people have time 20, to fall asleep to it. Not counting the references, that's a 22 pager and it's very long. That was one paragraph I just did, which took probably wow. two minutes. Well, I always want a long one to fall yeah. asleep to so I can put my sleep timer on. You should do it. Ninja Brian reads physics until you get so bored you fall asleep. But how would I read these equations? Trace? Ninja Brian bores you to sleep with physics. Oh, there we go. <laughs> ASMR. I like that. I might skip the equations. There's a lot of equations with like a lot of terms in here. By the way, I'll, I'll put this in the chat here. This is the paper that I just read. I don't know why I'm doing this because it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'm not going to read it. And I like that you asked like what type of ASMR that you would do because a lot of times when people are like, okay, I'm going to try ASMR and they just like whisper a sentence or they like tap on something next to them. And mm -hmm. ASMR is more than just sounds. And I think that this right. is where a lot of newer ASMRists, they mess up when it comes to making their channel is they don't actually understand what ASMR is. And so they think it's just sounds and it's more than that. Like it's the personal attention. Da, 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 da. So yeah. yeah. Like anything, there's, especially anything with as big a community as ASMR has, there's a wide range of styles and preferences. So yes, yes. it is not unusual for people to just dive in and, or take the caricature, right? And, or what they think it is without doing any research into yeah. what the options even are. And of course, part of it is, as I'm sure you did and everybody does, you find your style by doing it. You know, yeah. you start down one path and then you kind of adjust as based on what you're enjoying and what's working. Try a little bit of everything and then eventually you find stuff that's right and that changes over time as well. But yeah, I'm glad you said that. That's a very nice compliment. So thank you. I meant it. I think it's a natural question to be like, what are my options here? What should I be doing? It's Especially go since to I don't his know. Head. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'm probably the best person to ever do ASMR, if I had to guess. <laughs> I've told this story on the show before, but my eight-year-old recently, a couple months back, did a 
simple multiplication problem. And then she said, Daddy, am I the best person in the world at math? Oh. And I was like, honey, you're very good at math, but I think there might be some people out there who are better. That is too cute. It was so cute. You know, and I love the confidence. This this child oh, is a walking yeah, ball of confidence. Good. They need That's confidence. Great. Yeah. Especially for when they hit puberty. <laughs> oh, yes. yeah. Have enough of it banked up. I think I'm going to need confidence for when she hits puberty yeah. <laughs> because I, I will get my ass handed to me on a daily basis by this kid yeah. who is a walking roast machine. Those dunks are going to go nuclear, just drone oh, strikes on your ego constantly. Oh, yeah. Now is the time we move on to segments. So our first segment, as it is every week, is our pop culture recommendation segment. This is where you get to talk about a book, a movie, a TV show, a video game, something you've been enjoying recently. This segment has a theme song, which we add in post, so you're not going to hear it now. But the segment is called What's Poppin', and the theme song goes here. What's Poppin'? What's Poppin'? So that was the What's Poppin' theme song. Now, Amy, I will ask you my favorite question to ask, which is, if you were to have heard that theme song, what would you have thought about it? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I thought it was great. Of course. I thought it was awesome. It was really catchy, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. (laughs) Layden, what's poppin'? What's poppin' for me is a YouTube channel called Wristwatch Revival which is a guy who just gets vintage wristwatches and totally restores them. Uh, And he'll get ones that are just super beat up. So I I came, quote unquote, home to Aaron and Susie's, who I'm staying with place yesterday. And Aaron was watching Wristwatch Revival. And I just immediately, I was sucked in. It's like the dream of... uh, specialized tools and somebody who knows a lot about a thing that you don't know anything about. And he, you know, oh, love that. Best. breaks it open, restores it. Some of them have like sentimental value of like, oh, this was this person's father's watch that he wore his entire life and she wants to get it fixed and get it running again. And I just never realized how cool watches are. Oh, they're so fucking cool. It's yeah. ridiculous. So yeah. as I mentioned to you before we started recording, Brian, I would love to have wristwatch revival on the show because I'm dying to pick that man's brain. Absolutely. That's another ASMR thing for me, actually, yeah. is when people talk about something, even if I don't really care at all, like I don't think I would care about watches, but if they are like, genuinely passionate about it and they're telling me about it and they're passionate when they're talking, ASMR. Yeah. Look at this channel. This is fucking fantastic. <laughs> This is cool. It's so great. We were drinking wine last night and just like back to back watching <laughs> wristwatch revival videos. This that is, is great. That is different. Okay. But very cool. We'll reach out. Yeah. Not something I would have like found on my own, but hard not to get sucked in when he's just like, all right, so we're going to see if we can get it running. Oh, I'm so emotionally invested in this. Like, <laughs> this is very sweet. And also so many little like, you know, a little lazy Susan with tiny screwdrivers and like, you know, a die mm-hmm. press that's specifically to get the crystal out of the watch. Like, wow, look at all these tools. I know these things existed. Yeah. yeah. So that's what's popping for me. Amy, what's popping for you? It's popping for me. I feel like this is a lame answer, but The Last of Us show on HBO. That was mine last week. I love it. Oh, really? It's okay. pretty great, okay, cool. right? Yeah. Yes. I love it so much. I'm a huge fan of the game and they just are doing such a good job recreating it. And they're making like the moments that hit hard in the video game, even worse. Like (laughs) it hits harder. I have never played the game, so I have no idea what's coming. And I'm going into it like with no knowledge of any characters or plot points. I kind of wish I was like that. Yeah, it's pretty great. Everyone's doing such a good job on it. I love Pedro Pascal, Bella Ramsey, both awesome. You know, it's a prestige HBO show and all the actors are fucking great. They're all bangers, right? Yes. Uh, Yes. It's really fun. Last episode, some good new monsters showing up. Mm Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. They really came out with a bang. They showed the bloater for the first time, ripped some guy's head in half. Yes. Bloater ripped a dude's head off. That was pretty awesome. Yeah. I got to say, I like, what were the other clickers? Are those the ones with the, they can't see and they've got the, right? Yep. Yep. It's grown because it like, it, it originates in the brain. Well, not in real life, but in the game, the virus is in the brain and then it grows outward through their oh, eyes. Okay. 
So they can't see, but they do the clicking for echolocation. The echolocation, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I liked the opening shot of the whole series is like a, it's supposed to be an interview from the 60s or something where the interviewer is Josh Brenner, who played Big Head on Silicon Valley, the TV show, whose character there was just a complete idiot. And watching this guy who, the most recent HBO show he was in, he was playing, you know, a guy who keeps failing upward to become eventually president of Stanford. To watch him positioned as this like intellectual talk show host, I thought was, there was a moment of cognitive dissonance where I was like, Big Head is interviewing these guys in the 60s? What? I thought was pretty great. I had that moment a little bit with, I think he was like a scientist or something, but it was the guy from The Mummy. He played Jonathan from The Mummy and I just kept looking at him like, oh my God. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Which was also a dumber character. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) why does he know so much about about zombies? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Craig Mason's done it again. Amazing Mason. (sighs) Yes. Craig A. Mason. Um, Well, The Hangover is your favorite movie, right? (laughs) Or sorry, Hangover Part 3 is your favorite movie. Parts two and three. Thank you very mm-hmm. much. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I just realized, I think I, I'm still giving John August and Craig Mazin two bucks a month for Script Notes, their screenwriting podcast that I haven't listened to in years. Oh. It's fine. You know, it's a good show. Craig Mazin can be a bit much. Brian. Yes. What's popping? Well, look, I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, although I it was before you you came back from your break, Leighton. Uh, and I think it was a peach then, but it's a what's popping now. I recently acquired a PS5 oh. through semi-legal means. And uh, no, I bought it at the Sony store. <laughs> and I have been playing Elden Ring, which <gasps> I am 20-something hours into it. And I still don't know what the fuck is happening. Oh, yeah. You'll never know, actually. You'll finish the game and have no idea. Right. So have, have you, you've played it and finished it? Yeah. So I just beat Stormvale Castle. And Godric the Grafted, I think was his name. And that castle alone would be enough for one video game in any other game. It took me many hours to figure out what was going on there. And it's just, I I get it now. Like, I get why people were so into this game. It's really fun. I've never played a Souls game before any of the From Software stuff. So everything about this is new to me. And it's really fucking fun. And finally, I get why people, whatever it was, a year ago or whenever this thing came out, were so obsessed with it because it really, it really is great. Yeah, I love games like that, especially when what you do makes the outcome. And like even like during the game, like the little choices you make, I love that stuff. I didn't realize that. So you interact with people and you tell them yes or no about things that affects the outcome of the game. Yeah, and like who you choose to be friends with and not friends with. There's like I think eight endings or something like that. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't realize that. Amy, are you you into Bioware games at all? Like Dragon Age, Mass Effect? I actually haven't gotten into those. I I don't know why. I think it's because so many people tell me to play Mass Effect that I'm just like, no. No, I don't want to. (laughs) Oh, I completely feel that. I'm I'm a big Dragon Age head, but based on like your general D&D fantasy, caring about like romances and friendships and stuff... I think it's very much your wheelhouse, but everyone's going to tell you to start with Inquisition, and I think Inquisition is the worst of the trio. Is it like a strategy where you place people around a map or something? Dragon Age Origins is a tiny little bit like that, but it's it's just like an RPG, and uh, okay. you know you can you can be a mage or you can have a big sword. Did they come out with a new one? The newest one is Inquisition, which was a couple of years ago. God, I I won't go and do a whole Dragon Age tangent, but worth checking out. Which one should I start with if I do? I guess Inquisition, because Dragon Age Origins is like probably my favorite game of all time. Really? Okay. Yeah, it's amazing, but it's so dated and it's so Mm. hard and like frustrating mechanically, but story-wise and character and dialogue-wise, it's chef's kiss. Two people really hated, but I think is the most accessible. And then Inquisition does like a lot of new shit, but it's not as like narratively cohesive or interesting to me. Like there's a lot of really dumb additional thing. Like there's an open world element that is not as present. Hmm. I mean, listen, there are some games that I'm like, heck yeah, open world. And then there are other games where I'm like, why did you make this open world? Yes. Yeah. 100%. Inquisition gets a little bit of that where it's like, go into the hinterlands for another radiant quest. It's like, fuck. Why are you doing this to me? (laughs) Yeah. Open world can feel very oppressive. I mean, the wild part to me about Elden Ring is it is by its very nature oppressive. 
There is just Mm -hmm. way too much happening. At least I have no idea where I'm supposed to be going or what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yet somehow it's still fucking fun. And I think that's because they hid so much around this gigantic map that no matter what you're doing, there's something cool around the next corner. It does. Sometimes it gives me anxiety, games like that, that are open world, but there's just too much. Yes. Like when your quest log is just like 50 quests, I start to feel like it's almost like I, I have like a chore to do. Right. Yeah. That's right. Breath of the Wild is one of my absolute favorite games. Same. But I will say I almost prefer when it's just regular RPG Zelda because Mm -hmm. it feels like the story is more, you get into the story more because like you're just always in the story. It's like, yeah, it's more coherent. Yeah. Yeah. I said it's like a book, but with open world, it's like you're going over here, you're doing this, you're doing that. So it's just, I don't know. Yeah, because the story wise, it must be a writing challenge. I don't know. I've never written a game, but when you have like 40 different story elements, which you could unlock or not. Yeah. That must be hard to write and have it feel at all coherent, right? I'm also kind of a completionist when it comes to video games. So like I want to collect all the weapons. I want to do all the quests. And that's another reason why it can feel sort of like anxiety ridden because I'm like, did I get all the quests? Because in some games like Nier Automata, if you move on to the next like main story quest before you get some other quests, like you'll never be able to access those unless, well, when you finish the game, you can go back to that chapter, but like it doesn't feel the same. So I always get so anxious, like, especially with, with Elden Ring too, I was like that, where I was like, if I go on to Stormvale Castle, will I miss this quest in right. some That's random, right. which is true in a lot of times, but. What I like about Elden Ring is there's lots of creepy guys and I like hanging out with creepy yeah. guys. So yes. it's nice to, to be among my own kind, basically. Oh yeah. There's a lot of creepy yeah. guys in that one. There's a lot of creepy guys. Yeah. I guess on a similar note, I was going real hot and heavy with Red Dead Redemption 2. And then mm-hmm. I realized that like going forward in the main story means that, you know, there's kind of a big paradigm shift here. And it's like, no, everybody's chilling and we're all in the same. Let's let's just like hang out here. I'm going to go hunt some deer. All right. Everything's fine. Nothing bad is going to happen. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Now it's time for our final segment, which is a three-part gratitude exercise and one part petty grousing. And it's called Peaches and Lemons. And the theme song goes here. We will each start with a lemon, which is a minor bummer, grievance, annoyance, or what have you. I will start in that I really like red wine. I like a nice a nice Cabernet. It's delicious. It's pronounced Cabernet. Cabernet, <laughs> yep. A hundred percent. Cabernet Savage on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> me, me and Aaron, and, thank you. Me and Aaron and Susie have been trying some different red wines and like appreciating the notes. We had a really, really good one last night that had sort of like a plummy, plummy flavor to it. Mm-hmm. But red wine is just impossible to drink without then feeling like a just complete slob. Because <laughs> it's like your lips are red, your teeth are red. You always see movies yep. where like people are being sexy drinking red wine. And it's like, that's not how that happens. <laughs> your teeth nope. are purple. You're going to wake up in the morning with like purple crust on your mouth. Your mouth feels coated sometimes if it's one of yes. those wines that has like the the thickness oh, yeah. to it. You, you're like, oh, what is on my tongue? Yeah, it's like my face smells bad and I have a headache. It was just like immediate headache and I only had like maybe half a glass of wine. It was like, man, yeah. this is tasty. Why is it making it so difficult for me to deliberately poison myself with a small amount of alcohol? Jeez. Well, if I if if I can make a suggestion, one way to prevent that is you do a wine shandy where you mix half a glass of nice red wine with half a glass of tap water and you just mix them together and that way it dilutes the effects of the the wine a little bit. That sounds terrible. It's awful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'll be sure to try that. Yes. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, that's my lemon. Who else has a lemon? Amy, you want to go? Basically, there's this uh, makeup product I use to make fake freckles. And for the longest time, I actually gate kept. Anyone that asked me, I'd be like, I don't know, I don't know. It was some, some from before or something. <laughs> um, and it's like a company... <laughs> Which I don't gatekeep. Like, this was the one thing that I gatekept because it was like a small company and it makes the perfect fake freckles. But um, they haven't restocked in like over a year. Uh Uh-oh. 
it's like a company, I want to say it's either in LA or maybe it's overseas. I haven't looked in a while, but I think that it's like karma or something for gatekeeping because <laughs> basically life was like, oh, you're not going to let other people know about it. Then you're just not going to have it either. But I finally ran out of that fake freckle product and they are TBD going to restock. Uh-huh. So very upset about that. Now I have to go back to like individually putting freckles on my face, which is so. Oh, was it like a, a sp- <laughs> spray? So I will say it because it doesn't matter to gatekeep it now, but it the, it was freckles, P H freckles, and it has like a bristle wand, and it came with a stick. Oh, and you dip it in like this brown liquid, and you just kind of like go like this, and it just like hmm. sprays on your face like paint, and you kind of dab it in, and it looks yeah. so freaking natural. Like I had people. They just assumed they were real. I also assumed that your freckles yeah. were legit. Yeah. No, they're not. <laughs> it's the product. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm just, I'm not going to be a freckled goddess anymore. I'm just going to have wow. to be a regular, regular freckles Just, just a regular <laughs> goddess. Just a regular, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> regular <laughs> goddess. Wow. Yeah, this does look like a great product. How did you find that in the first place? I don't even remember. Probably some influencer on Instagram Maybe. A freckfluencer. Someone who wasn't gatekeeping it? <laughs> Someone who wasn't gatekeeping it, yeah. That's, that's how I probably found it. Great. Brian, what's your lemon? Oh, uh, my lemon is, so I've been looking for uh, a new crop of animators to work with for music videos of various projects. And I put on my Twitter uh, this past week, hey, looking for some animators, uh, curious who's out there that I don't already know, post your reels below. Within like 30 minutes of that, here comes the spam. Not on Uh, Twitter, but email. And my email address uh, is not public. But within the past week, I've gotten upwards of 50, and I'm not making this up, hello dear emails about animators. You know, hello dear, like these spams that you're like, hello dear, look at my new Costco gift card. Click on this link. So somehow they got, the email address for my kids band, which is an email address. The band emails are out there and I get these all forwarded to me. And at first I was like, oh, wow, well, someone emailed me. That's weird. And they're all from names, you know, it's like, oh, this is from Dave Smith or whatever. And at first I was like, oh, they just didn't read the instructions on the tweet, which were like, please post your reels below. And I was like, oh no, these are spam bots from like design 720 or something which uh, these poorly written weird spam bot emails about animation services. You know, it's it's a very minor thing, but I was like, come the fuck on. I can't post a tweet about one of the animators. They're so annoying. It's like that, you know, that in the, uh, we're going to optimize your YouTube channel. Have you considered oh signing, God. you know, like. I get like three of those on. a day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. All the time. And like they go to the priority inbox too, no matter how many yeah. times you're like, no, this is this not is a priority. Bad. Stop tricking me into thinking that I have an emails from an actual human being. Yes. Yes. I also very briefly want to call out the PR firm whose name I will not say that keeps emailing us on this podcast. Oh, shit. Asking us to book their weird <laughs> fucking pseudoscience quantum bullshit guests. <laughs> because what? they clearly don't listen to the show. It's not like they're going to hear this. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, I can't blame them because, like, I would PR, they're not going to listen to every show. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, it's like we get pretty regular emails from them pitching us, you know, new age healers, which, okay, if that's your thing, whatever, I don't care. But I'm not, they're not going to get on this show. You know, it's not what we do. That's so random. It is random. And seemingly, everyone they rep is a new age healer of some kind. And they're pitching us these people, which were like, you know, Bonnie first realized she was an intuitive healer when she owned a pet rabbit growing up in Spokane. You know, it's like, come this on. This is literally, that, that, that is yeah. so like barely obfuscated straight up. Like one person's credentials was like, you know, this really started with his relationship with his companion dog. Like, I, I'm not surprised by that at all. I can do quantum energy healing because I have a dog, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I'm going to pitch myself now. My favorite one. I might make a video of that now. I'm like, not even kidding. Oh, that'd be amazing. There was one person that they pitched to us who said they were on, quote, the Quantum Council. And I'm not making that up. You remember this, Layden? The Quantum Council. I do do remember this because your response to it was so funny. (laughs) I am not one to generally respond 
to such emails, but it was the bullshittiest bullshit in bullshit town. And we were being emailed by the mayor of bullshit. And <laughs> I had to write back. I felt like it was my duty to... Uh, that is too As good. someone with a PhD in fucking physics. In quantum physics. I am a quantum physicist. This is literally the thing I know about. And I was like, A, there's no quantum council. Because if there were, I would know someone on it or be on it. Okay? So there's no fucking quantum council. All right? Don't, t- don't give me this bullshit about the quantum council. B, no. It's not happening. Get this person... <laughs> off of my email. What, oh. And you were way nicer than that too. You have consistently been so nice to them while also being firm. <laughs> I'm polite, but firm. You know, I'm not like, fuck you and your fucking quantum bullshit. It's just like, you know, yeah. basically I say, we don't give a platform to people who believe in pseudoscience or spout pseudoscience. But let's just say that the late night group chat in which we share these emails- uh, Is a little saltier. A little bit. Is a little yes, saltier, yes. That's, that's a little saltier. Right. What I liked is then they wrote back, not this most recent time, but the time before, with a sorry for the missed mark. And I was like, oh, my oh. God. No. Yeah. Okay. I was like, no, the, the, I wasn't complaining. It's a bad. F- okay. Sorry. Anyway, this became a, a, a secondary lemon. Just don't, 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 don't ask don't me pitch. to. Don't pitch us. Don't pitch us these guests, which are definitely bad. A, l- a little offshoot of the lemon. I don't know what we call that. Lemon with like a ton of seeds, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's when you're cooking and you cut a lemon in half and you go to squeeze it, but you didn't get all the seeds out and the seed pops out and it's like, well, shit, I got to deal with this now. That's what that was. How about this? It's a, it's a limoncello. Oh, okay. But I like limoncello. Yeah, I do too. Anyway, peach time. Peach time. We'll each do three peaches, which are good, nice, exciting, big, small, whatever they are, as long as they're, you know, nice. I'll go. I spent essentially a month doing stuff that I detailed on previous episodes of the show and thus did not have access to makeup or do my makeup at all. And now I'm back doing my full face. Feels good. A, I feel like a 12-year-old before I have my brows on. And B, I just don't feel like me without a wing, you know? Like that's, that's an essential part of becoming human every day. Second peach is last night I made dinner for Aaron and Susie. So I made a nice little pasta you know, Parmesan roasted garlic situation with some uh, roasted cherry tomatoes and... I like the word situation. Yeah, it was a situation. I like show, I like going to a, to a friend's dinner and saying, well, what's this situation? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, they've been feeding me very well and cooking nice stuff, so I wanted to cook them a little something. And um, I hate that, you know, your friend cooks for you and you eat it and they're just like, oh, this didn't come out the way that I, and you're like, shut up, you're feeding me good food. I like it. And then I cook and I'm like, do not, do not start denigrating it. Don't do it. <laughs> it you made food for your friends. Don't shit on it. And in my head, I'm like, I fucking made too much of the pasta and not enough of the sauce. I didn't toss this well enough. I should have done, you know, I, I hadn't made a, a roux in years. Oh, that's really hard. Stressful. Stressful because it is just that like, oh, okay, it's good. Uh, I need to add more. Oh, fuck, shit, shit. Oh, 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 we're back. We're back. And then that over and over as you attempt to get mm-hmm. the consistency. So, so you're, you got it really ruey. Yeah. You got to make sure that Great. it's not ruined. Oh. Yeah. oh, okay. Very good. Oh, very good. Thank you. And then my last speech is this morning I stopped at a Starbucks inside a Target and there was a lady with her, I guess maybe like three-year-old in front of me, but the little kid like had one of the little uh, cheese boxes that they have. And I had also got one of those. And so we were like making eye contact, both holding our little cheese boxes. And then I waved to her and she got really bashful and hid behind her mom's legs. But she kept doing this like, this comical cartoon, like. Yep. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I did a little peeking you know what they love? for audio only listeners. What? When when they do that, you just kind of give them a little point like, hmm? Oh. <laughs> and then they duck behind the leg again. It's really cute. Yeah. Yeah. It was really adorable. It made me happy. So those are my three peaches. Cool. Uh, Amy? Well, first of all, Girl Scout cookies are back. <gasps> and I'm yeah, very excited are. about that. What's your favorite? Thin mints. I know. I'm just like a thin mint person. Yeah, you know? It's a classic. It's a classic. But they have these new ones. Do you freeze them? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Can't eat them any other way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Same wavelength here. But they have a new one. I can't remember the name, but it's like a chocolate. I think they call it brownie something. It's like chocolate cookie with like some peanut butter in the center. It's very good. It's a new one this year. Definitely try them. But yeah, we got like four boxes of cookies. So we're stocked up, but I'm very excited that Girl Scout cookies are back. 
Oh, these are, uh, I believe you're referring to adventurefuls. <laughs> Do they look like a brownie cookie with like peanut butter in the center? It's that. Yes, that's it. That's it. That's it. That's yes. an adventureful. Ooh. Those are really good. Hmm. That looks amazing. They're my second favorite already. Girl Scout cookie. Raspberry Rally. What? Oh my gosh. Wait, what? It looks like a Thin Mint, but it's raspberry. Do they have more online or something? I swear fully half of these cookies I've never heard of or seen before on the Girl Scouts website. There was only like eight yeah. on the table. So I don't know. They, they like to discontinue things. On this website, you can get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. No, that doesn't 13, sound right. Thirteen what? different types of cookies on this website. Lemon ups, lemonades, Girl Scout s'mores. Raspberry rally. Sounds like a Mario Kart level. I might have to look into this and buy even more cookies. Okay, sorry, I got distracted. But yes, that's a good peach. <laughs> So as a content creator, lighting is just like the most frustrating thing ever. Um, and even like five years into it, I still feel like I don't even know what I'm doing. But I got this new light and I love it so much. It's uh, like this little mini light and it has the aperture mini something. But I feel like it's just so good. <sighs> just bought so many lights that I hate. And it's nice to finally find one that I, I don't hate. Such a pain in the ass. That's yeah. great. Because they're always so expensive too. So then you open it up and I'm like, wow, this kind of sucks. Like, yeah. So yeah, lighting can be so frustrating. And lastly, I started reading books again, which sounds terrible. You know, I haven't really read since high school, but that's kind of how it is. You know, you watch TV it's instead life. of reading books. That's life. But I feel like my brain is healing because I'm, I'm reading books again. <laughs> And I'm just like really excited that I, I'm reading full books. I don't know. Because I think almost when you're in high school, when you're forced to read, it almost ruins it for you. And now all of a sudden reading becomes this chore in your brain. But I feel like I finally am back to, okay, this is a fun thing again. Awesome. That's great. Something that I, because I was such a huge reader as a kid and then I stopped as I got into, an, into adulthood and like getting a Kindle and the Kindle app on my phone is what completely changed it for me hmm. of just, you know, being able to be like, ooh, interesting book. I'm going to read it right now. And I can read it instead of looking at Twitter. Yes. Yeah. Brian? <sighs> yeah, what? Peach? Peach? <laughs> yes. Are you okay? I, I will happily peach. Oh, I'm great. Okay. Yes. So my peaches are, as they frequently do this week, uh, some of them involve my eight-year-old daughter. She's just been crushing piano recently, and she's having a really great time with it. And she just learned when the saints go marching in and could not wow. have been more thrilled to play it. And I love watching her have a great time with it and be proud of herself. So it's, it's really fun and gratifying. And she loves talking music and playing music and singing songs. She told us she has a trick for songs with lyrics. And we were like, what's your trick? And she said, I sing the lyrics. And I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, I've great. i never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, Great. Uh, so that's my first speech. What a great fucking kid. She's just the best. She rules. She really does rule. She's going to be unstoppable as an adult, and I can't wait to see it. The second speech, as we talked about last week, Leighton, you and I are both going to Creator Clash, uh, the influencer yes. boxing event in Tampa in April. No way! And yeah. yes, we will not be competing, but we will be there. I'm going to be playing a show. But the fun thing, which I don't think I mentioned last time, is I was told... Travel was super expensive and it was going to be hard to find a reasonable flight. But guess who used points? Ooh. Got some points and I used them for a ticket and it was not expensive. So congratulations. Nice. Like some of these plane fares are like seven, eight hundred bucks. And I got my plane ticket for free. I didn't realize that that's where Creator Clash was being held. And I wish I had known that. Because oh, like when I saw yeah. that that was a thing happening, I was like, oh, it's probably in like L.A. Right. You would think. It was in Tampa last year and it's in Tampa again this year. So we're going to be coming to Tampa. If you're anywhere nearby, let us know. It'd be great to see you. Yeah. Let us buy you a coffee or something. Yeah. Or I don't know, maybe not coffee if you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I still love coffee. I'm still a huge coffee person. <laughs> and my final peach is just that uh, lunch with a college friend yesterday. You know, and it was just nice to catch up with, with an old bud. We were in the same dorm freshman year. And then hadn't seen each other much for the intervening 20 whatever years and then caught up at our last reunion and hung out a couple of times. And he's a really sweet guy and uh, also named Brian. And it was just great to see him. So, wow. you know, nice catching up with old friends. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's great. And those are my peaches. Yes. Wow. And that's our show. Amy, that's our this has show. been a joy. I've been so excited about this and I'm I'm really happy we got to hang out. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I've been excited about this. So yay. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. If people at home want to find you and watch your very, very good ASMR or your D and D show, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Where yeah. where can they find you? So I make videos on YouTube on the channel Amy K ASMR. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram, Amy K ASMR. But I live stream D and D actually two times a week now. The one campaign is on a YouTube channel, Roll for Relaxation, and the second one is Roll Positive Gaming on Twitch. So the first one is on Monday nights, and then the second one is on Saturday midday. So if you're into D&D, I do a lot of it. Great. (laughs) Awesome. I love it. Brian, I feel that the onus always ends up on me to close out the show. Would you like a shot at it? Sure. Uh, Yeah, to close out the show, let me just promote my new channel, Brian Bores You to Sleep. It's an ASMR channel. I'm the reigning king (laughs) of ASMR. I mean And uh, I think you should... You should... should, uh, Subscribe, smash that like button, of course. Find me over there. And uh, in terms of ASMR, I'm the one to beat. (laughs) (laughs) Well, everybody, see you next Friday. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Late Night is produced by Brian Wecht, Leighton Gray, and Jarek Centeno. Follow us on Twitter at Leighton Night, on Instagram at Leighton underscore Night, or email us at LeightonKnight at gmail.com.